Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of the Do Better podcast. My name is Dr. Megan Miller, and we don't have my co-host Joe Smith here with us today. Instead, we have two very special guests, and we're going to be doing something a little bit different today and discussing a specific research article with one of the lead authors of that article. So I'm very excited today to have Dr. Bettina Kassad and Julie with us. With uh, First, I want to introduce Dr. Kassad, and then I'll introduce Julie Press. So Dr. Kassad, her training is in social psychology with a specialization in social cognition and intergroup relations. And her interdisciplinary research addresses topics in industrial organizational psychology, health, and education. She examines stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination from both the targets and perceivers' perspectives. Her particular interest is in stereotype violation and how individuals who violate expectations are evaluated and treated, and also how being a stereotype violator affects one's identity, psychological well-being, and physical health. And what's really interesting about Dr. Kassad, to me at least, is that her background is not specifically in behavior analysis, but the research that she publishes and the program that she's a faculty member of it's very, seems to be very in line and connected with a lot of the work that we do as behavior analysts, which is why Julie suggested that we should have a conversation today. Julie is a BCBA who lives in St. Louis and we connected over Facebook and social media. We have yet to meet in person, hopefully someday after COVID is over. And Julie, I apologize. I don't have a specific uh, biography for you. Did you want to tell um, the guests, anything about yourself? Yeah, uh, so I'm uh, Julie Preuss. I'm in St. Louis, and I actually got to know Dr. Kassad as my professor um, over at UMSL, so that's the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Um, I took some social psych classes with her, and then I also, um, for a brief time, was an assistant researcher in her lab. Um, and at the time, she had just moved her lab from California. Um, to St. Louis. So it was in the beginning stages of just kind of getting up and running, but I was able to go to some of the journal clubs with Dr. Kassad that she led, and I really, really liked what I learned from her. So um, she really like talked about like contextual cues and the environment and how those contextual cues like really um, interact with the person's performance, um, which is kind of like a I guess a line that goes through a lot of her work or less the work that I've seen. Um, and she also kind of looked at, you know, how those contextual cues affect um, people from different minority backgrounds. Um, and I really just felt like it made so much sense. There's a lot of science there, but, um, and I'll let her talk about that. But so when I started my master's um, in behavioral analysis, I kind of really pulled that content that I learned from her um, and just kind of have continued to use that in my professional work as well. Um, right now I'm working with preschoolers and I do ESDM therapy. Wonderful. Thank you, Julie. And thank you so much for connecting us uh, so that we could have this episode today. So before we dive in on the article, Dr. Kassad, would you like to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm an associate professor at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and my training is in social psychology, which is a field that we consider very interdisciplinary in terms of in terms of it being a hub science within psychology. So because I study social behavior, it connects with so many areas like clinical psychology, developmental, neuroscience, cognitive psychology. So I'm an, an associate professor in the behavioral neuroscience program, and so I've um, navigated into the field of social neuroscience, where I try to um, contextualize neuroscience research. So as Julie said, social psychologists study human behavior by looking at the interaction between the person, which includes their personality, their characteristics, their history, their experiences, but also considers the a context, the situation that they find themselves in. So that could include the current cultural context, it can include their 
uh, their family environment. And so predicting behavior is very complicated and to do that well, you need to look at the whole person, not just their personality or their dispositions, but also the environments in which they live. And so much of my work on diversity and understanding reasons for underrepresentation in the sciences is looking at these contextual issues and the psychological mechanisms that can contribute to disparities above and beyond the things that most people would think of like people's abilities in a certain area or people's interests in a certain area. So I'm happy to be here today and, and discuss how my work and the work of my colleagues is relevant to um, your work in behavioral analysis. Wonderful, thank you, Julie. I loved my social psychology class in undergrad. And I think that as behavior analysts, we can all benefit from that, especially the model of the interdisciplinary that you were just talking yeah. about, because sometimes mm -hmm. we get stuck in our own little bubble. So, right. Okay, so the article that we decided to talk about today, and I will include information about this in the show notes, is called Wise Psychological Interventions to Improve Gender and Racial Equality in STEM. So I think it would be helpful first if there's any background information to provide about this. I know for me, when I saw this article, I hadn't heard of WISE feedback before and it was really interesting to learn more about that. So I don't know if you wanna start out a little bit broad and just kind of give background to how the article came about and then we can dive in on the different interventions that were explored. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start first with the, the diversity problem in STEM. So STEM is, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And these are fields in which countries compete to be global leaders. Um, and science, you know, right now among, amongst the, uh, the COVID pandemic, we're searching for vaccines and treatments. And so science and technology are at the forefront of how we live our lives and our health and well-being. And we've had for some time a lack of diversity in these disciplines, um, specifically women and people of color. And the issue is that we don't have enough scientists and engineers in the U.S. workforce. Um, and so when companies are looking for skilled labor, um, they have to often go to other countries. And so um, the U.S. has really focused a lot of its efforts on recruiting more talent into STEM and focusing on the inclusion of women and people of color. Um, for example, only 30% of people in STEM fields are women. And even smaller than that, only 13% are considered underrepresented racial minorities. Um, and so this is unfortunate because we have natural homegrown talent that we could be tapping into um, to improve economic development. You know, we're in St. Louis at the University of Missouri, and we have a deficit of, of people in the workforce to fill some of the skilled jobs. We have major companies in the city like Boeing um, that come in and need um, scientists and engineers, and we can't provide them with that, um, that capital. So it's really also an economic issue that um, STEM fields are very lucrative. They're, they're high paying um, salary jobs. They have many benefits. And so it's one way we can also help to achieve gender and racial equality in pay and in economic mobility by um, educating students who can go on and with a bachelor's degree get a really good job and have a career in science. So that's one of the reasons I entered this area of research is my passion for gender and race equity is making sure students have equal education opportunities regardless of their race or gender or their economic background. And then when they enter the workforce that they're able to secure the jobs they want and not experience prejudice and discrimination such as racism and sexism in hiring or in promotion. Um, so the research article that I published is a review paper of many existing studies. So I have to give credit to all of my colleagues in social psychology and education who did the research. And what I did was I summarized it and integrated it into a, a user-friendly friendly format so that people can learn from what we've done. And I think a lot of people in education have gravitated towards this research in social psychology and policymakers as well. So that's the idea of this kind of article is that it it becomes more um, digestible for people outside of the specific discipline. So the idea of wise psychological in interventions is not my own idea. It comes from my colleagues in social psychology and education. Um, 
such as Walton and Cohen, and they really started looking at how can we intervene when we see racial disparities in education. For example, African American males um, are underperforming in high school compared to their peers from other racial groups and they're more likely to drop out of high school. And so the researchers wanted to figure out what was going on and why psychological invention, interventions are um, named that because they target specific psychological mechanisms that play a role in whether or not someone is successful in a specific environment, like in an educational or a workplace setting. So these interventions are um, brief and low cost, so they're um, you know, easier to implement than, than bigger, more expensive interventions. And again, they target psychological mechanisms so they can create lasting change within individuals. Individuals can change their mindsets and how they think about their own abilities and performance. And that's the kind of change that you, you keep for a life and you can bring with you to many situations. So the interventions that I summarized, I chose, uh, I chose six of them. And I, I looked at what psychological need is addressed in that intervention and what kind of methodologies are used so that people can consider applying these interventions in a school setting, in a workplace setting, or in a clinical setting. Um, one example that has gotten a lot of popularity or a lot of exposure in, in popular media is um, the gross mindset intervention. So Carol Dweck and her colleagues have been looking at how people think about intelligence. And um, we've learned that many people in the United States think that intelligence is something that you're born with and you sort of have a genetic capacity for intelligence. And that if you weren't born into a family that is um, you know, highly successful and, and affluent, you might not have many chances at um, you know, education and career in terms of the prestige and, and wealth and so forth. So the idea that intelligence is something that's fixed, it's innate, it's something that you're born with is very limiting because you know, if you look at the IQ spectrum, we know that you can't have that many people in the top really highly gifted categories. Most of the people fall somewhere in the middle in the average to above average or below average range. So what's good about the growth mindset is that it, it presents intelligence as something that's malleable, something that can change, something that can be developed. And we know from a, a, a lot of educational research that how students think about their own abilities affects their performance. So if a teacher has high expectations of his or her students and feels that their students can achieve as long as they put in hard work and effort, then that is more... Um, more um, motivating for students than to say, well, you know, you were born into a lower income family, both of your parents are blue collar workers, neither one of them has a college education, so we don't expect a whole lot from you. So we, one of the beauties of the United States is that it's touted as a place where people can be anything they wanna be and that there are opportunities for everyone no matter what background you come from. So this growth mindset um, encourages students to focus on hard work and effort um, to be successful, and that it also provides them with resources. So, it, you know, having students get um, support in the classroom from teachers and tutors, making sure they have access to the resources they need. Um, just as a side note, during the pandemic, we realized the digital divide, that there are so many students out there that don't have access to the technology they need. They don't have stable internet. They don't have a laptop they could use, or there's one computer in the home that is shared by the entire family. And then when you've got parents who are working remotely, you've got siblings in high school and siblings in college, everyone is competing to use the, the computer and the internet. So this has really shown that we are not the great equalizer that we proclaim to be, um, that we have a lot to do in education to fill those gaps in educational opportunities. So the growth mindset intervention, um, like I said, has been very popular. It, it has been implemented at as early as elementary school, all the way up to college and university. And by encouraging students to take this promotion mindset of growth and development, then they don't feel like they have limits on their potential. Yeah, and I think one of the things that really stuck 
out to me um, in this section was um, there's a point where it says that um, the psychological problem at work here is the tendency for students to attribute failures to lack of intelligence instead of weaknesses in their study strategies, which I feel like right. is a lot of what we work in um, within beh behavioral analysis is like, you know, we often try to say like the if the student isn't performing to how you are wanting them or you expect them, it's it's not the student's fault. What's wrong with the teaching strategies? You know, mm -hmm. so looking at those things that that you know again that the student has available, like why do we see these gaps? You know, why you know? Oh, mm -hmm. so there problem with technology oh well that makes sense now we're talking about tangible reasons why um, there's this disparity in grades um, that mm -hmm. can be now targeted you know and that the person can see if the person is older not you know children it's maybe a little harder but maybe teenagers and so forth would be able to say oh okay I can do these strategies and I should be able to obtain better success right yeah, we, we have a tendency in the United States to make internal attributions for behavior. So if something goes wrong, we blame it on the person. Well, they did something wrong or they weren't prepared. And we forget about the situation and the environment, which is, again, where social psychology comes in. There's also things as simple as, did the child have breakfast that morning? If they're hungry, they can't perform at their best cognitive potential. Right, so there's all these other things going on. It could be lack of access or familiarity with technology. It could be that there's distress in the home and they're preoccupied with things going on in their life and they can't focus. And so rather than blaming students and saying, well, you're just not smart enough, we really need to take that whole picture of, you know, what's going on in their home life? Um, are, they, are they healthy? Are they getting the resources they need? Basic food, shelter, you know, love and caring and all those things. And then once all those needs are fulfilled, then we can look at their intellectual potential and give them the resources that they need. So, you know, like you said, it's important to look at that, uh, the whole picture, not just tell someone, oh, you're just not smart enough, you know, don't worry about it. Yeah, and you also notice, um, you kind of say at the end of this little section that, you know, that how teachers are highly influential um, and how they um, communicate their expectations regarding a growth or fixed mindset, you know, mm -hmm. so if you, if the teacher has this expectation, well, I did my goals, you know, I have all my behavioral data, these are the things that we need to focus on, um, and the child is not performing, you know, it's just so easy to, you know, just um, to say, well, the data is right, you know, instead of digging further in and saying, well, right. maybe that is right, but it's not really full, showing that full picture. Right. Yeah, I think I think education and clinical practice has changed that we're, it's more of a, a learner centered focus rather than an educator centered focus that it's not on. Um, well, I'm teaching you this way, and if you can't learn, that's your problem. Now it's how can we tailor the, the strategies to help the learner reach their full potential? So I think going into uh, types of behavioral therapies that not all therapies work for everyone, that they have to be tailored to the individual and their own learning styles. Um, and I think we know more about that and why there are such achievement gaps is that, you know, it's not a one size fits all. So to the extent that teachers know that and educators know that, that, that they promote this growth mindset and that they use a multitude of strategies to reach learners, then I think we'll see these, these learning gaps um, close. So you said, I think the next one is communal goal interventions. Tell us a little about that. So um, communal goal interventions are um, focused on the idea that many women and some racial minority groups have been disinterested in the sciences because they don't see those careers as fulfilling their life goals. So for example, if you think about, you know, if you asked a child, you know, draw a picture of a scientist, you know, who would they draw? Probably they would draw a male probably the person, the male would be white, wearing a lab coat, maybe wearing glasses, sitting at a computer, um, and, and, in a, and the only one in the room. 
So the, the stereotype of scientists is not very appealing to many people. They don't want to have a career where they're working in solitude for long hours. They're deprived of social connection with their friends and family. Um, and it's the stereotype that you have to be a genius to um, be successful in science and engineering. And that turns a lot of people off. People want to be able to have a career that's um, rewarding and that addresses their personal values and also allows them to have a happy social life and be able to raise a family. So um, the communal goal interventions really sort of change the way we advertise science careers. And it says that, you know, science can be used to solve social problems. It can be used to give back to your community. And scientists really work in teams of people. It's very collaborative. Very few um, discoveries are made by just one person. It requires multiple people from multiple disciplines with lots of different areas of expertise. Um, and once people learn that science is more collaborative, um, that there's you know, connection with people, and that ultimately you're solving a social problem or giving back and improving a community, then the people are more interested in science. So women tend to prefer careers that um, have values around communal goals, so helping people or making connections with people, rather than focusing on things like, you know, tinkering with machines or focusing on coding technology and so forth. Um, and this has also been found with certain um, race ethnicity groups like um, the Latinx po uh, population and also Native Americans, that people want jobs that fulfill their personal values to give back to their community. So if we can reframe science as um, community oriented, connected, and contributing to um, you know, improving the environment, improving people's well-being, then we can attract more diverse students. One quick example, I worked on a project with some engineers in California from uh, San Diego State University and California State um, Polytechnic University in Pomona, and they had a project where they took students over to South Africa and they looked at um, wastewater management and the, the engineering of waste um, disposal, wastewater systems, and they used engineering and other sciences like chemistry and mathematics to improve the wastewater systems of local communities so that they could have clean drinking water. Um, and so that sewers won't, weren't overflowing with, you know, sludge and, and debris and making a community unhealthy. So engineering is being used to literally provide safe, healthy drinking water and clean communities and improve the environment. Most people wouldn't think of engineering in that way. They might think of engineers build bridges and they build buildings, but this is a way where low-income communities in Africa that don't have drinking water or have flushing toilets now have access to uh, drinking water and sanitation. And so that's an immediate real world problem that's being solved using science and engineering. And so once students see that, value that they're helping people, they're giving back to their community, they're solving social problems, and they're working in interdisciplinary teams, they're much more excited to get educated and follow a career in STEM. So the communal goal um, interventions have been shown to be very effective in helping to diversify the STEM field. Yeah, and I, Megan, tell me what you think about this. When I was reading this part, um, it actually really hit me how uh, in behavioral analysis, you know, um, our top level um, clinicians, we call them board certified behavioral analysis. There's some who have masters, some who have PhDs, um, but largely those who work within the community are women. However, I, if I'm, Megan, you have to tell me if I'm right or not, but aren't there still more males though doing the, uh, with PhDs doing the academic research? That seems to be the case. I haven't, there was a research article that was published. Um, I think it was Dr. Anita Lee and a few others. It was in the last year or two um, about the different trends and there's definitely more women in the field now, but the, the leadership positions and the uh, like publications are still more representative of like if you look at lead authors and things like that it's still more men <laughs> and I, I mm -hmm. have to laugh about this section too because my husband is an engineer and um, 
even though like behavior analysis is a science and all my degrees for undergrad and masters are in psychology science and i have always accelerated in math and science when we've talked about these this particular uh, myth if you will um mm -hmm. he, he has he has that understanding as well like he's worked with plenty of he's worked I shouldn't say plenty he's worked with women um he used to work at nasa and he worked had women like you know, coworkers and whatnot. But when, whenever I've like brought that up, the issue of less women in STEM, this is the exact answer he gave me. Well, they're just not attracted to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's because we do a poor job of advertising is really what it is. Yeah. Right? Well, and I, I remember when I was in even high school, um, I was fortunate that all of my science teachers were women. And one in particular, she went to, she was from MIT and was teaching high school. She said she preferred that. I'm not really sure why. Mm -hmm. but she was really encouraging and trying to convince me to like apply for more, you know, chemistry or engineering or different sciences other than psychology, which was my interest. Um, and I mm -hmm. remember like thinking, well, the only boy, the, the only people that really like those sciences are the boys in my class, right? And like mm -hmm. you her as a model to show, like, no, this is something right. you can do. I was still like, no, this is a that's for men. Right. Yeah. If I might comment on the disparities between women in, in therapy compared to academics, um, therapy, it, it's very easy to see that you're directly helping people, right? You're working with clients, you're helping them solve problems. And so many women are drawn to the helping professions like nursing or teaching or, um, you know, clinical practice, because it's very easy to see that you're directly helping people. In contrast, if you think about academic jobs and doing research, it, you have to, you know, connect a few more dots to see how those fields are also helping people. Um, so researchers are doing the basic studies that are then used by clinicians in their practice. And so without that research, clinicians wouldn't have the tools that they need to help their clients. So there's sort of a, you know, indirect relationship there. It's not necessarily directly helping people, but it's still contributing to the knowledge of the clinical community. Um, the other thing I'll say about that is when people look at the career opportunities they have, they might think, oh, well, someday I want to, you know, get married. I might want to have children. And they see a job in therapy. Maybe it's a Monday through Friday, nine to five job. And they see that as fitting well with having a family, children who go to school, you know, having weekends off, whereas an academic job is not nine to five. And it's, um, you know, it's a 24 seven job. There's no boundaries between working and home life for many people. There's a lot of uh, pressure to publish. So the idea of publish or perish, um, you have to get federal grant funding to be active in your research. So people are often turned off to those careers because they think that they're not conducive to having a family. Um, which is not the case, right? You just have to find the right fit in the right kind of university. So I think that those are a couple of reasons why we see those disparities among women in, in your field. And I mean, that kind of steps right into the next intervention of utility value interventions, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, tell mm -hmm. us more about that. Yeah, so this research um, came out of uh, University of Wisconsin um, with um, Judy Harakevich looking at what people value in a career. So there are some um, overlaps with the communal goal uh, interventions, but the utility value is people want to do things they're good at and people want to do things that they see have value um, because it gives them a sense of purpose. And, you know, many of us derive a sense of identity from our careers. And so the goal of these interventions is to show people the value of science and how useful it is. So, you know, all of us take math and science classes in high school, and we might think that they're not very interesting or not very useful. You know, like I can think of taking calculus and thinking, when am I ever going to use this math in my life, right? <laughs> um, and and uh, or or I remember taking a physics class and thinking, I don't ever plan to build a race car. Why do I need to learn about speed and and you know distance and this and that? Um, so by helping people realize the utility of these skills, you know, um, these disciplines offer many more skills than what is taught in a classroom. So once people see that these skills can be used in their real life or in their career, 
they become more interested in, in studying uh, math and science and, and technology and engineering. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I think that, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, our skill sets, you know, there's a lot of different subfields within behavioral analysis. And um, one thing I was thinking about, I don't know if we've um, fully addressed is, you know, we work, um, we have a little um, department that works really well with yours in industrial and organization psychology, um, our OBM. Mm -hmm. And they share a lot of the same premises, you know, looking at, um, you know, behaviors within the context of the work environment or in different organizational environments. Um, you know, and just trying to figure out how do you get people to, um, you know, really reach those goals of a group, which by nature, honestly, is a communal group, right? Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. In most, um, if you look at the advances we've made as a country or as a society in technology, engineering and, and science, they're, they're in teams, right? So like Google, for example, changed the structure of the work environment so that people work in these little pods. Um, I think Amazon does this something similar. So the idea that you work in a team and you have people in the team have a diverse skill set so that you're complementing each other. Um, and I think that that's a skill that we don't teach very well in school of how to work with diverse teams and how to be a good team member. Um, people have this idea of achievement in the United States. It's an individ individualistic effort that you have to do everything on your own and achieve on your own. And so I think if we, you know, change people's mindset that really it's a collaborative effort, we work together as a team, then we can accomplish so much more. Yeah. That's definitely, I mean, that definitely seems like the trajectory of a lot of different research these days, um, you know, working on um, how to maximize group efforts. And honestly, it also helps you from having um, excess waste and resources. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's more effective for organizations to have uh, multidisciplinary teams. Um, yeah, like you said, they can have or shared resources and so forth. So more cost effective and then ultimately the product and the efficiency and the, and the creativity that comes out of it is, is much better. So I did notice that there, they did um, see a little bit of difference between um, Western and Eastern um, cultures on there's, I think they said that there are two different interventions um, that utility value interventions are categorized into proximal and immediate, which are immediate and distal mm -hmm. future goals. And they were showing us some differences between Western and East Asia. You wanna talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of goes into cultural differences in um, being individualistic or collectivistic. So people in the US, um, we're raised in an individualistic culture. We focus on individual achievement, um, which is why a lot of people think, you know, you have to do everything yourself and you don't wanna rely on a team. Um, and then, therefore, people are focused on their immediate short-term goals of success. Um, and so utility value interventions that focus on more immediate goals, like getting an A in a class, uh, graduating with your bachelor's degree, um, people in the U.S. are more, um, more comfortable with that approach because of that focus on individualism and an immediate success. Whereas in East Asian cultures, it's more uh, collectivistic. The focus is not on the individual, but on the, the group. So it, whether it's the family unit or, you know, a team of scientists collaborating together, um, the, the appeal is more on long-term future-oriented goals. So those distal goals, um, because that's going to promote the longevity of the group and the, you know, the, the stability of the group in the long term. And so that was more appealing for East Asian students because it was a fit with their cultural upbringing. So the, the interventions as a, a theme throughout this article is they have to be specifically tailored to the group that you're targeting. Um, and so it's important to look at cross-cultural similarities and differences so that, um, you know, people doing interventions can make sure that the intervention is appropriately tailored to be well received by the by the audience because we do know from the research that people can fail at interventions and actually do more harm than good. Um, you know, one example is diversity interventions in the workplace. There's a lot of mixed research on the effectiveness of it um, because people might do it um, 
in, in a, you know, have ineffective strategies and the people, the audience is not receptive to the approach that the trainers are taking. So, you know, unfortunately, we don't have um, a lot of good diversity interventions for the workplace, which they're very much needed. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I feel like that's something that um, we are in our field is specifically really trying to kind of branch out in and, um, you know, make those collaborative um, connections for diversity um, to, you know, empower um, people within our field from diverse backgrounds, but also to educate people within our field of why their differences really do matter. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and the trick is to recognize difference but then value difference, right? So it's easy to point out differences but then equally valuing them is where people get stuck. Um, and you know, we don't wanna take a colorblind approach where we just ignore difference and assume that we're all the same and because that, that devalues uh, important parts of people's identity. Um, so the, 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 you know, by working in teams, people do, um, there is re research showing that if people work in diverse teams, they develop more positive attitudes about diverse topics. And if they have contact and exposure with diverse people in the workplace, they tend to have, you know, less racism, less sexism, and, um, and it, it's, it's better for the team overall. So I think that's definitely a way that we need to continue in terms of improving diversity in the workplace. Yeah, I really agree. I mean, one of the things that I took with me after I left AMSOL, um, I enjoyed my time in your department. I also um, got a lot from um, uh, Miles Patterson with nonverbal behavior um, and just mm -hmm. look at cultural differences. And so I kind of looked at that interaction with our field on my master's thesis. And one of the things that really struck me is that you know, we, we create these um, interventions for child, like say if it's a child, so for children, um, but we're asking the family to be part of that therapy. We often do mm -hmm. um, training so that the parents are, are taught how to do the therapy themselves. It like can double mm -hmm. the amount of therapy a child gets. And so we do a lot of our therapy looking at social reinforcers, you know, so like mm -hmm. laughing, clapping, saying, oh, good job, way to go. You know, and it mm -hmm. really hit me how like that's really not going to be um, reinforcing or culturally acceptable to like a lot of cultures. Um, Asian right. cultures are really one that stand out, and so you know, tailoring that um, that part of our therapy, you know, if we're using that to try to gain a child's motivation and the family's motivation, well, it may backfire. They may not actually continue to generalize that therapy at home. Right. Yeah, and I, that's a great point. And I think um, I want to make a couple of follow up points. Um, the first is that there are also cultural differences within the US within racial groups. Um, so for example, even among white Americans, although, you know, white Americans live in the United States, they have, uh, they live in an individualistic culture, some subgroups are more collectivistic than others. And the research on these interventions in higher education have found that low income individuals and people who are first generation college students tend to be more collectivistic than people who come from middle and upper class families or who have parents who've been to college and who sort of have a family legacy of college degree attainment. So the idea is that low income students, well, if you think about a low income family, in order to to be, um, you know, to thrive in society, they have to rely on others for resources. So they might rely on other family members to help um, with financial support. They might rely on um, sources in their community, like a religious organization or nonprofit organizations, um, you know, to get resources like go to a food bank or go to, you know, get free health services. And so people from low income communities often have more of a collectivistic communal mindset. And so they also might be deterred from an individualistic, individual achievement orientation. And I think this is something that we've only really recognized in the past couple of decades, that social class, even within the U.S., even within a racial group, um, is a cultural difference and, and how we think about the world. There's a great book by Susan Fisk that talks about the class divide 
and how being from the lower classes versus middle and upper changes the way you view the world, like your sense of agency, your sense of control in your life. Um, so I think that for families going through um, therapy, that would be a big factor is social class and how um, much they can, how much they are um, accepting of that form of therapy. Does it match their values? Um, yeah. And so you mentioned, you know, East Asian families. I would also say we see um, Native American and um, Latinx families uh, appreciate more of a communal collectivistic orientation. Um, so I think that's where tailoring, um, you know, we don't want to make assumptions based on someone's race or ethnicity or their social class of what intervention would be most effective, but there are ways to assess it. So there's measures of like communal goal oriented orientation or people who are more agentic goal oriented. And so the intervention suggests that having a blend of both can be effective, but there's no reason you couldn't assess a family's values, um, you know, of do they have more of a communal orientation and, and then tailor the, the therapy to their personal family values. Yeah, I really like that point. I think, I mean, I really think that's something worth um, chewing on, honestly. What do you think, Megan? I don't know if there's much uh, research looking at those differences right now in behavioral analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I love that description of, you know, there's different considerations to make, but you always need to, to check in with the group or family that you're working with and see what their preferences are. Um, that's always one of the risks, I think, in our field and probably others where somebody reads something in a journal article or, or a book or watch it goes to a professional development and then they just start blindly applying whatever intervention right. in every single situation that they have instead of really analyzing the appropriateness of it. Right. I had a right. question for you too, Dr. Kassad, that's kind of related to what you were talking about with the sort of newer acknowledgement of the importance of looking at for culture, socioeconomic status. How about if, and if you don't have any input on this, that's fine. But in terms of disability, because I've noticed a lot mm -hmm. in our field that there's a lot of push forward and recognizing the need to look at race and gender identity and sexual orientation, even though our field primarily serves individuals with disabilities, that that is usually not mentioned. <laughs> it's like right, a group right. to look at and to consider, you know, what you're going to do and how to recognize their individual preferences and things like that in the work that you've done so far, have you all incorporated disability at all as one of the cultures that you look at? I would say that you're spot on that there has not been enough research looking at disability. Um, and I know from my own work in STEM that there isn't a lot of research on the success of students with disabilities in STEM. And there's actually you know, there are quite a bit of barriers. Um, I went, I've had a couple of grants from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And through those um, communities, I've met researchers who do study disability as a, as a form of diversity in the sciences. And one issue is something like, imagine someone in a wheelchair trying to navigate a chemistry laboratory. Um, you know, the, the hallways might be very narrow and might not be able to accommodate a wheelchair the height of the uh, lab tables might be too high. Um, and also the, the equipment might not be easily accessible. Um, like if someone doesn't have the manual dexterity that they need, or you know, there's a lot of fragile equipment that's easily breakable. So labs are not set up for people with any um, different ability. And so that really does limit the number of people with disabilities who go into science and engineering and we know it's important to have people who represent the community serve in these roles as scientists and engineers. I'll give you one quick example. Um, back in the day when car airbags were first developed, the team of engineers who developed them were all men. And what happened was the first, um, you know, the first draft or the initial phase of, of um, airbags the force was too strong and there were cases where women and children were getting killed by the 
the force of the deployment of the airbag. An airbag is supposed to save your life, not harm you. And so they found out that the airbags had to be tweaked. Um, you know, they tested it on a male frame that's ten typically bigger than a female frame. Um, and then they went back to the drawing board and realized they had to, to tweak it. Now, if you had had women on the team of engineers, that may have been prevented, right? They may have been able to say, well, hey, that force is too strong for this smaller frame. So if you have scientists with disabilities at the table, they may be able to say, hey, we, we need to think about the, the usability of this design. Because someone who um, is considered able-bodied, they're not going to think about, is this accessible to other people? And I think that's a, very, a major bias of our culture in general, is that we make the assumption that everybody's able-bodied and everybody, you know, no one has any mental or physical disability, and then things are designed and deployed for that population. And then, you know, that immediately creates dis uh, disadvantage and disparity. So I think that is an important point that not enough research looks at disability. I think that is slowly changing as laws have been developed to protect um, the rights of people from of, of disability. So for example, in higher education, there are many more resources available for students who need, um, you know, accessible classrooms or accessible technology. So, so my response is we haven't done enough and no, there has not been a huge focus on people with disabilities in STEM. And I think that your point with um, the accessibilities of the um, laboratories is a good one. I, one that, that um, I would love have, to have studied more is like, I have dyslexia uh, and dyscalculia. And so I have a real difficult time with like spreadsheets at times, the more tired I am, I make more inversions. Um, and then uh -huh. some web designs that we have for a lot of schoolwork are just really not um, user friendly. And there are a few mm -hmm. universities that are looking at this. Like there's one in Washington. Um, I can't think of the name right now, but just looking at how technology, you know, is actually can be such a tool, but it can be such mm -hmm. a for our students. Right. And like we don't even have full accessibility to just having internet so that's one problem right but then also once you have it you know are those web pages you know is the font accessible to all people is you know right. is there too much on the page where uh, a person cannot attend to this what needs to be um salient to them you know are there too many distractors so i think there's a lot right that could be definitely um focused on within uh, the stem field for sure right yeah Definitely in higher education, there is a more of a need. And I, I will say, you know, I've been teaching for maybe roughly 20 years, and there has been a lot of change over time where if you design a new online course, it does go through um, a quality control system where someone will review, like your PowerPoint, do you have the right color font? Do you have the right size font? Is your presentation accessible to someone with like colorblindness or um, you know, some other need. And those are things that most people don't think of if they're, you know, they don't have a learning disability or they don't have anything that um, might prevent them, you know, from using technology to the fullest potential. I think that's changing, but it's, but it's been slow. Um, but, I, you know, I think um, as legislation continues to recognize these disparities and disadvantages and then makes laws to help, laws and policies to make to level the playing field, I think that will drive behavior, um, you know, more so. Definitely. Well, tell us about your values, affirmation, interventions, which um, for the listeners in our field, um, if they haven't already seen the commonality yet, a lot of the things that Dr. Kassad touched in um, align really nicely with ACT, our acceptance and commitment therapy, um, different programs. Um, and I actually did research on values, um, different interventions for Dr. Kassad. So I was really excited to see this part in her article. So tell us about that. Yeah, so this research on um, values affirmation um, really came out of the work on stereotype threat. And um, in the early 90s, um, Claude Steele and his colleagues um, identified stereotype threat as a as a as a potential source of racial disparities in um, academic performance. 
And so stereotype threat is a psychological phenomenon where if you're a member of a stigmatized group for which there's a negative stereotype about your intellectual ability, then you might worry about your performance um, being judged based on your race or gender, for example. So um, the stereotype that women aren't as good in math as men, or the stereotype that African-American students aren't as smart as white or Asian students, those kinds of stereotypes can be dis uh, debilitating to individuals from those groups. Um, and it's not that people don't have the ability, it's that they have this anxiety that other people are thinking, I'm gonna perform poorly because of my race or gender. And it's, it kind of goes back to those expectations, that growth mindset, that if people have low expectations for you, that's gonna cause some anxiety. So stereotype threat, um, there's been a lot of work around interventions to reduce it, especially in academic settings. Um, but the values affirmation intervention came out by saying, hey, you know, if, if, if you're threatened in one domain, you can bolster your self-esteem and identity by reminding yourself of how good you are in this other domain that's important to you. Um, so I kind of see it as, um, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you have multiple identities and multiple skills and multiple values, if any one of those is threatened, you can rely on all your other eggs to come together and support you so that you can overcome a challenge you might be experiencing based on one identity. Um, and there is research to show that people have, who have complex identities, um, they tend to be better able to cope when one identity is threatened. And they also just have a more um, complex view of the world. They're more accepting of people who are multiracial or multicultural or who have different, um, different aspects of diversity. So the idea is that, you know, okay, if you perform poorly on a math test, you know, don't beat yourself up about it. Don't uh, internalize it and say you're not smart, that you're a failure. You can remind yourself of how well you recently did in your theater performance, for example. And that will sort of restore your self-esteem. And it doesn't even have to be related to the academic domain that you're threatened in. So it doesn't have to be math related. It just reminds you, hey, you're a good person. You, you can have great success. Don't let this one um, setback throw you off course. And so people can sort of reaffirm their self-worth, reaffirm their competence and their identity, and then get back on track to being successful in that area where they had a setback. Yeah, I, I mean, I really love this. And I actually found um, a small article that looked at um, shame, self-criticism, and self-stigma, and compassion, and acceptance, and um, commitment therapy. And it basically, in our field, we don't really have a lot of terms for, um, like, stereotype threat. We don't really use, um, uh, like, stigma. There's some for stigma. So there's a few articles looking at um, ACT for stigma. And, ACT itself like has six core processes of it. Um, so mm -hmm. context in the present moment, um, your Ooh. conscious awareness of your experience and what you perceive that's happening. Uh, the second mm -hmm. one is acceptance. So um, activating um, those psychological experiences directly and fully without feeling defensive. Diffusion, which to me is what you're kind of talking about too, is just like not taking ownership of those thoughts. Like you can accept that the thoughts are there, but you don't have to own those um, disparities about you. So when you're talking about people maybe looking at different types of their identity, they, you sounded like you're saying they would kind of change their focus, you know, to right. another identity to kind of bolster that, um, that, you know, I guess motivation to continue to work. And then right. there's, Self as context, which is um, a consistent perspective in which to observe and accept all changing experiences. And then values, mm -hmm. your life directions, you provide guidance for your actions, motivation, inspiration, and then committed action, what you're going to do to make those goals mm -hmm. happen. So when you're looking at the right. value, um, values affirmation interventions, are there more than one? Is there just one main one? Yeah, the, the values affirmation interventions are, are tailored to the individual. So they can be, they're usually self-generated. So you ask people to like make a list of things that they value or things that they're good at. And so then they can go back to that individualized list 
for themselves. And I think um, there are a lot of parallels to what you just described with this ACT approach that if someone is uh, ruminating about a failure, you know, they're going to be, you know, um, debilitated in, in addressing the challenges they're facing. And by reaffirming their self-worth in, in another domain, they can be, you know, sort of reset and not fall into the psychological trap of, of worry or anxiety or depression. And what you're describing is a lot like what I'm familiar with, with some um, forms of therapy for treating depression and anxiety is, is really having self-compassion. And I think that that's the term maybe that can be used. Um, you know, it's not directly stereotype threat, but when you experience a failure, um, be easy on yourself, right? Have some self-compassion. Um, and I think that our culture doesn't really encourage that, um, that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to have setbacks. It's okay to not be perfect. Um, and that if you, like you said, if you have, a failure, you, you recognize it, but you don't have to like accept those negative thoughts. You just, okay, they're there. I'm going to push them aside and I'm going to move forward with, with a positive focus. And so um, I think that that approach is, is definitely really effective in terms of um, improving mental health because people have a lot of unrealistic expectations for themselves and then they're likely to be disappointed. Right. And I think that, you know, when we are trying to talk about, you know, like our field, we do have families who, you know, have a lot of different components to their identity. Um, and again, you know, tailoring those things to understand, you know, why, for instance, you know, I know that I worked with a group, wasn't with um, behavioral analysis per se, but we were trying to provide um, families from uh, Samaria, um, and access to learning how to drive for the mothers. And uh -huh. it was really difficult, even though we had, this group had uh, worked with a lot of people within social work in St. Louis and did a lot of groundwork to make it as accommodating as possible. You know, the biggest barrier is just the men um, really didn't want the women, you know, going out in certain areas that men in the community were around, you know, so trying right. to find a place where it was just women who could be there to, to learn. Um, you know, these were the things that I think that we realized had a little bit of a problem in the way that we put together this program, you know, and so thinking mm -hmm. about all these things um, interconnecting when we're trying to make some kind of intervention, you know, really does matter. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, again, that's a theme with these interventions is that they need to be tailored to the specific group. Um, and that, you know, if they're not applied well, it could actually be problematic and cause more problems. Um, and, and I think that's where the research comes in, that the research can identify the conditions under which these interventions are successful and when they're not. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely culturally uh, appropriate interventions are, are critical. And the other thing that I was thinking about, too, that came out in the article to me was, you know, said that... Um, that individuals can protect, protect their sense of self-integrity in threatening environments by reaffirming their self-worth in other domains. And I was really thinking about how in our field, we do what's called behavior-specific praise, you know? So, you know, you, you know, shift the focus of the individual that you're working with, um, especially if they're a little bit older than like a young child, and to get them to focus on things that are easier before we start working on things that maybe make them feel less successful. Like not that we won't ever touch our intervention on something that's not successful. That's the part of teaching, right? Is to help someone fill the gaps in their learning. But we can do that in a way that, you know, that bolsters their um, integrity by giving them a sense of success with tasks, different work you know, and then maybe incorporating ways to do that in environments that are a little bit harder for them. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Like starting with the foundational skills that they have and, you know, any, any major project that's challenging is going to need to be done in smaller st incremental steps. And so by starting at the beginning of, you know, with skills that you know the person has and will perform well, sort of working up to those more challenging 
um, behaviors is, is definitely a good approach, um, whether it's in therapy or in, in life, that you can't just immediately tackle the biggest problem you're facing head on. You know, you need to sort of lead up to it. And that will help bolster the person's confidence in their abilities. Um, so um, self-efficacy is really important that you have to be confident that you have those abilities. If you don't have self-efficacy, you're not likely going to succeed at whatever you attempt. So sort of building um, people's self-efficacy on, on their strengths and then identifying how they can develop areas of weakness. And to me, it almost it seems like they're doing some kind of self, um, like a self-monitoring program with the, that song, right? That once you give the individual the skills, they can kind of tailor it for themselves. Yeah, I mean, people, that's, you know, it does require a bit of self-awareness and self-monitoring of knowing, you know, that's, it's sometimes it's difficult for people to really assess their own abilities. Um, and, and they might have unrealistic expectations and then they're confronted with a failure and they're surprised. Um, so I think raising awareness on self-awareness and, and helping people learn how to monitor their own behavior is important because I think that's a skill that we presume everyone has, but I think we, we've all met people that lack self-awareness and then we realize that that, that approach might not work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, tell us about the belongings interventions. Um, so the belonging intervention um, is one where it focuses on our psychological need to belong. Um, you know, that's probably pretty straightforward that as social beings, you know, we, we thrive on connecting with others and feeling like we're valued and wanted in different situations. And so when you're a, a member of an underrepresented group, like if you're a woman in um, engineering, for example, um, you know, Megan, you said your husband has worked with a few women in engineering, but there's usually not many. If you're in a group like that, you might wonder whether or not you belong there. You know, oh, I don't see very many people who look like me. Why is that? And so it's one of those environmental cues that suggests, oh, well, maybe people like me don't belong here. And so if we're trying to diversify STEM or diversify a workplace, um, you have to, you know, obviously you have to increase numeric representation. And to do that, you have to help people who are underrepresented feel like they belong. And it has to be genuine, right? There has to be this sense of connection and, you know, we want you here, you belong here. And so um, belonging interventions can, um, for example, at university, first generation college students often come in thinking, oh my gosh, how did I get in? They have an imposter syndrome. Like, I'm not good enough to be here. And so the community, the educators and, and people need to be able to create that environment that, that communicates to others, you do belong here and you're just as good as everybody else. And, you know, don't think less of yourself. And a lot of those could be environmental cues, like um, something as simple as like, let's say a, a medical office waiting room. Um, I've noticed that sometimes like the magazines that are available aren't very diverse in topics. And so if someone doesn't find like a magazine that interests them or represents their group, they might feel like, well, gee, what kind of people usually come here? Probably not people like me. And so something as silly as that could signal to someone you don't belong here or, you know, at universities, the, the picture of all the past presidents of the universities are usually older white men. And so people might feel like, gee, this is like the ivory tower. I don't really look like those folks. Maybe I don't belong. And so making small adjustments to physical environments is important, but more importantly, making connections with people so that they feel like they belong, their identity is affirmed, um, really is important. So, the, um, Megan, the thing that really struck out to me about this was thinking about um, behavior traps uh, within our um, within our programming and how that kind of can go into this. If if a staff or you know cl clinicians think about a way to put a kid in a school environment that will allow them to get those reinforcers, what are you thinking? What would you think about that? Yeah, I, <laughs> listen, you've stumped me, Julie. I don't have a, a great answer for this one. Um, it's not one that I've thought about, and I probably should think about it more. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about, like, you know, 
so behavior traps is kind of like, well, you, you want to increase a kid's access to reinforcers, you know, so what here we're talking about socially, you know, in the social context, you know, so that they are engaged that they're wanting to do the activity itself. And so kind of what you're saying is like, how do, how can we put in within the context things that create that, that ability, that thought process of belonging, you know, that allows a person to be at more of a baseline when they're learning, right? So if someone is in a state of stress, um, or if they're, you know, not able, to, they're in a meltdown, they're not able to actually focus and do, you know, some kind of learning, you know, that that thought process could be focused on the fact that they are a minority. And so switching that around um, within the context, I think could allow um, a student to, uh, you know, engage in a way that could promote reinforcers within their activities if we did it in a way that we work to embed diversity, things that made them feel like they belonged in that classroom. Um, you know, so in St. Louis, we have a lot of schools that get bused in kids to certain schools. Mm -hmm. We'll have that so that, you know, kids don't feel that their status as a black student is super salient, you know, like how do we, mm -hmm. that it's important, but also that they don't overly stick out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things, like I did this group with my son, he's four and a half and it was for families and um, it was books, different books to promote like anti-racism and diversity, equity and inclusion. And what was interesting about, I don't know, three quarters of the way through the group, they had sought some feedback from someone uh, to look at, I think it was like the last session and, and um, the person had a lot more expertise in diversity, equity and inclusion and pointed out kind of some areas where the people that organized the group were actually making the problem not making it worse, but like what you were talking about earlier with ableism, Dr. Kassad, similar mm -hmm. type of thing, you know, not being black, <laughs> the person that was organizing right. it as committed as she was to social justice and anti-racism, there were just certain things with the books that were chosen and, and that for that particular theme or, or unit that just right. didn't connect with. So I think it's important too, sometimes we might think that we're setting right. up environments to help it seem more inclusive, but we need to connect with people that could give input on that too. Absolutely, yeah. That's a key point there is getting collaborators who know the community. Um, and this goes back to our earlier conversation on, on just labels of how do people wanna be addressed? Do they wanna be um, referred to as black or African-American? And you won't know unless you ask members of the community. So, um, you know, I am an expert on the research on racism but I don't personally experience racism. So I wouldn't feel comfortable leading a diversity group without some diverse colleagues, racially diverse colleagues. And that's why it's important to, to have collaborators that are in the community because they also um, have the trust of the community members. And so we, we need that balance of people with the research expertise, but also with people with the knowledge of the community. And then that's gonna be better well received by the, the members. And that goes right into your, I think it's the sixth um, intervention you have listed, which is on role models. So tell us right. about that. Exactly. So, um, so I mentioned with uh, belonging interventions that if you're a numeric minority, you might not feel that you belong in a community. And so to help increase sense of belonging, we need people who represent the community. Um, so it, you know, it's sort of this chicken and egg problem. We have very few diverse people in this group. How are we gonna you know, attract more diverse people? Um, so getting more role models is important. There's, there's a lot of research that, um, that, that people do well when they have a same race or same gender role model because they can identify with that person and see, you know, hey, that person is like me and they were successful. Um, you know, like for example, having Barack Obama as the first African-American president, that was major for many people in the African-American community because it showed, um, you know, an African-American man in the highest position of power, that that level of success is possible. Um, you know, it's not without its challenges, of course, 
but but just seeing that it's a possibility opens opportunities for many people. Um, and so by getting people who represent your community in leadership positions who are running the programs, that will make that will help people identify with them, right? Um, so if you're working with a primarily um, African American community in St. Louis, you want to have African American members of the community as part of your team leading the training or conducting the session or whatnot, because people can identify with them and, oh, I'm like them. And if they can do it, I can do it. Or, you know, you sort of give more authority to what they have to say. Um, at the same time, role model success needs to seem achievable. So sometimes um, people are, you know, so successful um, that their success seems unattainable. Like if someone says, oh, well, they only did it because they're a genius and I'm not a genius, so I can't do it. You know, and that's where role models, it's really effective when role models share their personal stories. Um, like if Barack Obama, for example, were to talk to people thinking about law school and tell them about the challenges he faced in studying for his classes and passing the bar exam, you know, like humanizing people who've been successful and they're just like the rest of us, you know, they're not necessarily geniuses. They just worked hard and persevered and and were you know successful and so making them relatable um and and looking like your target audience is the is the best way to get you know effective role model intervention yeah and you know in our field we do a lot with social stories and i think that is something that you're kind of outlining here and i think i also saw it in the article um you know having you know if they if the person that you're trying to target doesn't have someone readily available in their community, right? We have lots of rural communities that are going to be really capped out and how diverse of a population they can even, you know, um, connect into in person. But um, they said that, you know, with those stories, like you give a story about a scientist or a story, like you said, about Barack Obama, you know, um, reading it or listening to it can, you know, help bridge that gap. And we do a lot of social stories and sometimes we'll um, actually tailor them in a way where they're actually specific for the person that we're working with to give mm -hmm. them some kind of awareness, you know, of the situation, the context. And I think that's something that we could build that concept into. And then also I saw that they will use online resources for online um, connections to kind of build right. that connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you raise a good point that, um, you know, I make that one caveat in the article that role model interventions usually aren't, they're not always affordable because, for example, if you're trying to diversify a workplace by hiring more diverse staff or faculty, that's going to take money, right? Or if you're in an area where it's difficult to have a diverse community, you can make connections um, through stories. Um, you know, for example, our history books and our science books don't um, give credit to women in racial minority achievements as much as they should. You know, like we don't know who all the famous women scientists are compared to the famous men scientists, you know, and making that a, a greater awareness or the role of African Americans in U.S. history or Native Americans and not, you know, only portraying them in this negative light like slavery or, um, you know, the, the, relocation of Native Americans, you know, there's other roles that famous um, people of color have had in the development of this country. And so being aware of that is the first thing. Um, and then it, you also mentioned online. So there's um, the National Institutes of Health have uh, developed and funded a national research mentoring network that does connect diverse students with diverse faculty. So, you know, if, if African American students that UMSL, for example, don't have any African-American faculty who they can talk to about their experiences. They can connect with an online mentor and, and you know, get access to those um, support networks that aren't readily available. So I think technology can be great for connecting people who are in different locations. Um, you know, and that being said, I, I should also mention that role models can also be members of different groups. So, um, you know, for example, men can be effective role models for women and white individuals can be effective role models for people of color. What really matters is um, the connection that you make with your mentees and that um, 
you know, mentors who are allies and who um, can better understand the, the challenges faced in the community and are, you know, have the cultural competence and the socio-emotional skills to be a good mentor can still be effective. But, um, but like you said, I think often we need to look beyond our immediate community to get contact with those mentors. Yeah, and I liked how you kind of um, highlighted the fact that, you know, when we talk about contextual cues, you know, especially right now in the political environment, our ads are all about contextual cues, right? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right now, right. Most, you know, negative cues, you know, and then they pair that with, you know, the political party that they're um, wanting to uh, trash or whatever. Uh, but mm -hmm. saying to like, you know, kind of flip that note. So, you know, you brought up Native Americans. One of the things that came to my mind is, you know, sure, we know that you know, we took over the Lord land, so forth, but also they're amazing storytellers. And some of right. their great um, writers in the literacy um, departments that just are fantastic, you know, so highlighting mm -hmm. those, and that really do come from their culture, right? This is an oral right. culture mm -hmm. tradition that now is written. And so just honoring those things and highlighting those um, those really positive aspects of their self-identity, um, you know, again, for with our act kind of allows the diffusion of, you know, the negativity, the, the, the negative um, mindset that they might have, and just kind of being able to see themselves within that context, you know, oh, you know, mm -hmm. I am good at this or that. And it, it's not about a stereotype, it's how that individual sees their self-identity and then, then applies it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So tell us about kind of your overall conclusions of your, you know, these six um, different interventions. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'll first say that um, when, when people think about interventions um, for like students or people in the workplace, they might think, well, why does this person need an intervention? Is there some deficit that they have? And like, for example, when we talk about stereotype threat, if I present it to an audience of non-psychologists who aren't familiar with it, their first inclination is to say, well, maybe those students just aren't good in math and you know, that's okay. And we can know it's not that they're not good. They, they have ability. It's the environment that creates this toxic situation that doesn't promote learning. And so I think we need to get into that mindset of not blaming the individual, but looking at the environment, you know, like diversity in the workplace. If you have one African-American employee in a department and you're wondering why that person is disengaged or calling in sick or is not getting their work done on time, you know, you don't look at the person and say, well, what's wrong with them? They're, they're just lazy. We need to, you know, we need to get them to work harder. Look at the environment. Is the environment conducive to them feeling valued and like they belong in that work environment? And so I think that these interventions really focus on how can the environment better meet the needs of the individual and make an environment that individuals can thrive in. And I think if we reframe it in that sense, then we feel a bit more obligation to do something about it. Because if it's something wrong with the environment, and we have the ability to change something, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we, right? But if you blame the individual and say, well, they're just not good enough, they're just not smart enough, they just don't get it, oh well, then these disparities are gonna continue and people won't be motivated to, to do anything about it. Yeah, and I think that for me, you know, when I've been working with children, you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, how these concepts that I did learn from your classes, you know, they seem big, they seem very academic, they seem um, more about, um, you know, maybe adults, but I really thought and kind of was trying to apply this with the um, preschoolers I was working with and mm -hmm. still currently working with. And so I work with a lot of diverse families um, that a lot of them are first generation immigrants um, coming from uh, Iraq, um, Iran, uh, Korea. I've worked with several different Indian families, you know, and so mm -hmm. um, when I think about like we had a classroom, well, what are the kids actually um, interacting with in that classroom? And there mm -hmm. are things 
culture in our learning classrooms? You know, the books that we have, are they representative right. of the children who are there? And also, are we trying to represent more than just who's there? So if you have a classroom who's just um, white children and black children, like maybe you should make sure that you don't have books just for whites and blacks, but also the culture that's in their environment. St. Louis is very multicultural, you know, and so right. it's really appropriate to embed those things in the classroom with pictures, with, um, you know, you can do things with holidays. Um, we do a lot of social class activities. Um, and then also kind of looking, I also was kind of thinking about like the playthrough that we work with, with children. You know, so I was trying to get things that I got like a little walk kit, you know, you can get. Really uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> I got like a PETA kit. You know, I have a lot of families who are, um, I worked with a family from Lebanon, you know, like uh -huh. things. we also interact with those things in our environment. You go down in St. Louis and one of our major strip areas called um, Del Mar Loop. There's a bunch of restaurants mm -hmm. there and they're very multicultural. So it's right. not even it's appropriate to the context of our U.S. So just thinking about, so I guess right. what I would encourage people in our field is to think about how these cues really can be used in more than just these ways that academic papers maybe highlight. Right, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you bring up good examples of, of food and, and holidays because I think those are ways in which people from different cultures can connect like food is a great way to create community, right? So having like an, an international buffet day where people bring a dish that's um, from their cultural tradition to share. And I think that those are usually really positively received and that people can learn about another culture in a positive way, you know, through the sharing of food. Um, and then holidays are another of learning about, you know, other holidays besides Christmas and what do those mean? And and those are things that people value and there's positivity associated with them. And so those are great ways to bring people together. And I agree with you that the, the materials in a classroom, for example, should go beyond reflecting the immediate community and exposing people to a global, you know, mindset because the world is ever becoming more and more global. And, you know, as we have people, you know, in the U S coming from all over the world and, and making their lives here, that we're just becoming more and more global. And we need to have a sense of global awareness. And I think there is a movement in education and even you know, at, at the elementary level of global citizens and that we're just, you know, we live in this one country in this great big world of many people and, and sort of helping dispel this ethnocentrism or this idea that the US is the best, you know, and that we're, our way is the only way of teaching kids about different cultures and it basically makes them a better you know more well-rounded global citizen that's going to you know be more be happier and thrive in a multicultural environment and and you know give back to a community in a in a better in a you know more meaningful way i agree and i also think it just kind of honors the cultures who've already been here for a long time like people think it's new but it might be new in your state. We have a lot of states who've had certain cultures for, you know, um, many, many generations and just kind of honoring that um, I think is important too. Right, absolutely, yeah. It, because with St. Louis, you know, it depends on where you are. You could be in a very diverse area or a very homogeneous area. And so people have limited exposure, but, um, you know, that's just, like I said, it's just ever changing that, places are getting more and more diverse, you know, even places in the Midwest. So it's, uh, I think it's important for people to gain an appreciation, get exposure to, and then in terms of the workplace, developing skills to work across cultural groups. You know, um, most companies are, are, are multinational and, you know, only speaking one language or only being familiar with one culture is going to be limiting to people's upward mobility in their careers. Yeah, totally. Well, Megan, what do you think about, is there any other way you can connect this to the behavioral analysis? I think you're doing an awesome job, Julie. I forgot to mention at the beginning that that's what we had decided to set up for this because you're so passionate about this area. It's been really interesting. I love when I can actually just listen and don't have to talk the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, honestly, I, 
the further I got out from UMSL, I found myself like honestly thinking more and more about what I learned in the classes. Um, and, you know, even in within psychology, they have like little camps and fields too. You know, sometimes um, those, any, anytime you're in academics, people can get very insulated. But mm -hmm. I like that, you know, there was a lot of pullover, a lot of connections that um, continued to make made sense to me then um, and continue to make sense to me now. And I feel like that they're um, help building me a foundational knowledge that can give me some kind of perspective and help me think about those things about ways we actually interact with families in the here and now. Mm hmm. Right. I think that's a critical skill that Ed, that students going through education to be a therapist or be a clinician need that training. And there's a greater focus on multicultural therapies, um, you know, cultural competence. And I think the demand is there, you know, there's, we need to be able to serve our population. And if people aren't trained and, and have the experience and aren't prepared, then they're not going to do a good job. <laughs> so, right. I think that that mindset, you know, needs to, we need more training of, of in education and then making those connections within the community and, and making the therapies accessible to people from various cultural backgrounds. So one thing I was thinking about, and I'd love to get your um, thought on this is, you know, when you are interacting with someone from a different race, ethnicity, and like it would be, a, it would be um, appropriate for a clinician to ask about that. You know, there are some assessments some people use. I don't think they're used very often, um, and I'm hoping that'll change. But what do you think is the best way to kind of ask and probe on those questions? That's in a, a way that's um, doesn't make the, the person feel uncomfortable. You know, but also, mm -hmm. you know, kind of engages and then maybe ways um, in academia that you actually talk about these different diverse um, definitions too. So like someone's learning about someone's, how they identify, is that yeah. what you're referring to? Yeah, how, yeah. Would you, like, how do you think the best ways to kind of ask those questions? You know, we have a lot of people who live in rural areas who don't have a lot of access to diverse populations to even get that skill set of how do you even ask? Right. Right. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll give the caveat that I'm not a cl clinician, but I would say as an individual, um, one approach might be first self-disclosure. Um, like I'm thinking of gender pronouns, for example, that by communicating your preferred gender pronouns has become much more normative. Um, so even my email signature says my gender pronouns are she, her. And um, that's becoming common that they'll be on name tags. So if you go to a conference and it'll say she, her, you know, he, him, they, their, whatever someone's pronoun is. So that's, I would say self-disclosure. Like if I were to meet someone and we were going to be engaging in some kind of a relationship, I might, you know, introduce myself. And um, like Megan asked earlier about my race ethnic background, I would say, um, you know, I'm a European American. I have uh, Irish and English ancestry. Um, you know, I, I, I refer to myself as European American, um, my gender pronouns are she, her, you know, how, sh how do you feel, you know, how should I address you or something like that. So if you're disclosing it first yourself, I think it makes it more normative that, that you're just getting to know the person. Or if you have sort of assessment questionnaires, like you mentioned, um, asking people to write in their self-identity of their race, ethnicity, rather than giving them like check boxes of predetermined categories that's used by like the census, although the census has gotten a lot better, um, of asking, giving someone an open-ended, you know, fill in the blank of how do you identify your race, ethnicity, or, you know, what are your, what are your gender pronouns, having people fill it in. Um, and I think the more we do that, the more normative it becomes, so it doesn't feel awkward to ask someone. That's a good point. And if, if someone puts down for race, say they put in or ethnicity, they put like more than two, like three right. or four, how would you interact with that? Trying to clarify, you know, would you say what, what is your primary, you know, if you were going to ask that, if there was a reason to ask that? Yeah. Um, that's, I wouldn't ask what their primary is because that's assuming that one has power over the others. I mean, I would say that they're multiracial. Um, 
you know, and then if it's relevant to the conversation, you might talk about those different NNAs. Usually if people check more than other, they write in on the blank, you know, what their background is. Um, but yeah, just knowing that someone has a multiracial or multicultural background that they're likely going to come from, you know, with multiple perspectives. Um, and one might not be more prevalent than another, which for someone with one or two identities, it might be harder to imagine, like, what's your, you know, mindset if you have all these diverse identities, you know? Yeah, and I mean, that's a good point. And I, I, I asked that for a specific reason, because I saw an article talking about that, how, you know, it used to be people would just put down two, but they don't anymore. Right. You know? so it's right. very it's very um, common to have three plus um, different. Right. Um, answers and, um, and then tell us a little bit about how a race and ethnicity is defined within academia, the norms, um, maybe some of the differences between academia and um, the vernacular in everyday life. Yeah, so, um, so one thing I mentioned is that language evolves and it evolves to reflect the current culture. So terms we used to use, we don't use anymore. Um, and much of that is related to power and stigma of who, what group is coming up with the terms and, you know, is it, is it a pejorative word or referring to someone in a derogatory way? And so I think that the movement now is to allow individuals to self-identify of how do you want to be addressed? Do you want to be referred to as Black? Do you want to be referred to as African-American? Um, maybe someone's Afro-Caribbean. Um, you know, that there aren't these sort of monolithic groups anymore, that there are people who have multiple backgrounds. And if you identify, if you ask them to choose one, that, that might not be a good fit. So in, in academia, we have our professional societies that dictate the preferred terminology. So for example, the APA, the American Psychological Association, um, you know, does the research of what are the, what are the, you know, accepted terms, um, you know, so for example, we don't use the term homosexual, you know, we'll say same sex or we'll say gay or lesbian because homosexual has a, a negative term or a negative connotation. Um, and these are things that we know because of research or because you ask members of the community how they self-identify. You know, they'll say, I identify as a gay male, I identify as a lesbian woman, I identify as genderqueer. Very few people are going to say, I identify as a homosexual. You know, that's almost like a medical term that was used in the DSM way back in the day. Um, so I think just reading the literature and keeping up on what are the preferred terms and, and when in doubt, just ask people, um, as long as it's coming from a place of genuine you know, interest and connection. Um, and, but I think it is a tricky conversation. It's not, you know, it's not easy to, to go out and ask, um, you know, that it has to be in a, in a interpersonal exchange where it makes sense to talk about those issues. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you it's not like it. <laughs> Starbucks writing it on a cup or something, you know, <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> right. Well, Real quick, what do you think, as we're wrapping this up, I know, um, but one term that I've looked up and I feel super awkward about um, because I've heard, oh, at first I thought it was really great. And then I heard, I read some um, articles and there was like a whiplash. And so I'm like, I'm not going to use it until I figure out what people think, but it's BIPOC. Mm -hmm. So um, BIPOC? yeah, Black indig Indigenous People of Color, BIPOC. Um, B OC and oh, you will, it's all in caps. Um, well, then maybe you can't even answer me. I really am not going to use it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I haven't seen that, but that doesn't mean it, it just is because of the literature that I'm reading. Um, and there are some disciplines that are better than others about keeping up on, you know, the preferred terminology. Um, I don't think psychology is necessarily leading the way in that effort. I think probably cultural studies, um, you know, there, there's research on indigenous populations that, you know, those researchers are going to know better why that term came to be and, and how prevalent it is. Um, but that just shows you how quickly language evolves to reflect a culture and, um, you know, like saying people of color versus some other term, you know, what does that mean? Um, 
you know, does that mean white people don't have color? Like, you know, it's sort of, unfortunately, a lot of times terms are defined as a, like a deficit or, um, you know, different than. And so uh, another example I, I mentioned earlier, the, the movement towards using the term Latinx, because Latino, which is the default, is a masculine term that doesn't reflect women. Um, and research shows that universal terms like using mankind or man to refer to all people doesn't work. People don't think of women when you say man, just like people don't think of Latino women. If you say Latino, they think of Latino men. So we need to have language that is, you know, degendered or gender neutral, like Latinx. Um, and then as communities develop identities, like you said, by POC, that might be the new term that a community prefers, and so it's gaining prominence. But then it takes a while to, of course, trickle into academic circles and communities for people to embrace that term. But nowadays with social media, things spread like wildfire. So right. there might be faster transmission of, of that term. But, you know, um, in terms of publishing, that's pretty straightforward because editors will give you feedback on what the appropriate terms are. Um, but working with individuals, I think it goes back to having people self-identify how they want to be referred to. Well, I was really appreciative for you to give me the definition to use for, um, for basically Latin people, because I have asked actually a lot of people this question. Um, and yeah. what I found in my, you know, just, um, you know, uh, personal experience, paper and pen <laughs> um, behavior data here is that it was really mixed. Like, you know, yeah. Some people were like, well, Hispanic only means that you have ancestry from Spain, which is how I understood it. But then I had right. a lot of people say, well, it's, you know, it's really based on the person. It's either or. And here I thought like that always meant, you know, and then I'm like, well, you know, if you're looking at literature, sometimes it'll say both. I'm like, are they two different groups we're talking about? Is it one? Um, yeah. So I love that there's a, an answer that I can um, relate, that I can keep um, for yeah. Latin yeah, the, the thing, though, is not all communities will identify with that term. I think it's a fairly academic term still. I mean, there are still groups gotcha. that, um, like I did research in California, and we have populations that refer to, uh, prefer to be called Chicano or Chicana or, um, you know, or Latino or Latina or Hispanic. You know, the Hispanic, the term most people, a lot of people don't like because it, it has the history of... Um, uh, imperialism of Spain coming and conquering South America and Latin American countries. So that's kind of the, but Hispanic is an ethnicity. The, the, that's a challenging one. And I'll admit, I'm not an expert on race ethnicity categorization. There's scholars out there that study this more in depth, but um, uh, Hispanic is considered an ethnicity, whereas like white and black are considered race. So when it comes to, uh, you know, appropriate terminology for someone who's Hispanic or of Latin based, it, it becomes a little trickier. Like someone might say they're Mexican, but that's their nationality, but they're Hispanic, that's their ethnicity. But it could be that Latin, Latin American is change is replacing Hispanic or Chicano, you know? So I think ultimately, in again, people in um, anthropology and eth who do ethnography, cultural anthropology, they're more on the cutting edge of this than I think psychology. Yeah, I, I, I would think that would be so. Um, I definitely know that trying to get some clarification, like what is Creole, you know, it's like, wow, yeah, there's yeah. A, lot of, a lot of mix in that hot pot, you know, it's just, there's right, a lot right. about, um, and like you said, there are people who really look at the history components of all of that. Right. Yeah. And it, and it's, I think for some people, they, you know, they might dismiss or get frustrated that the terminology is so complicated. But if you learn why, like if you say Creole, well, that to me brings up French colonization, right, of, of African communities and slave trade and, you know, the, those kinds of things. And um, so that term might be perceived negatively by some communities, but then there's also people will sort of um, embrace a term and, and that used to be negative and reclaim it. Like the word queer, for example, um, used to be, you know, considered a negative term in the 70s of, oh, that person's queer. Don't be queer. But now it's embraced 
and saying, you know, I'm part of a queer, the queer community or I'm gender queer. You know, it's now it's if it's um, I'm, I'm not getting the words I'm trying to find here, but it's re re identified by the group. And it's who's doing the labeling. If it's individuals within the community choosing labels, then that's appropriate. But if it's members of a majority group assigning a label to someone, like we don't use the terms Oriental or Negro anymore because those were words that were assigned by the majority group um, and had negative connotations, you know. So I think as long as people are self de self defining and self describing, I think that's ultimately the way it's going to go. We noticed that there's that trend also within um, disability cultures. Um, so yeah, um, autistic cultures. Um, there mm -hmm. are cultures. Um, we have neurodiversity, um, which is a culture, yeah. and there are people within neurodiversity culture who also identify mm -hmm. autistic culture and deaf culture, and which, um, honestly, I'm um, kind of delving into myself, um, just some side um, studying just to learn about because, you know, even though um, I know people who are technically part of that culture. I don't really know about the cultural components of those things very much. Mm -hmm. I did um, a, a uh, neighbor, uh, is that when I was around 10, I moved into this house um, and the girl across the street, her dad was deaf. Um, you know, mm -hmm. nobody had been around people who had been deaf before. I knew a little bit of sign language, um, but was interesting to talk to her was that apparently her dad had gotten his, um, primary and I guess secondary education um, at a, um, a deaf school in St. Louis downtown and uh -huh. talk about how he would take her to um, they had like a carnival every summer you know and she would go uh -huh. and you know she would talk about what fun it was and how you know her dad would go but that um, he uh, read lips so whenever he left the school, he, which was mostly on sign language, which is a whole culture itself, uh, he mm -hmm. kind of lost that touch because no one else was signing with him on a daily basis. So I see. Um, mm -hmm. talk about how he, when he would go to uh, the carnival, how he like would really want to get into that culture, but it was hard for him because he didn't know it all, you know, but he right. still identified with that from his upbringing, you know, and just, uh -huh. yeah, you know, it was like something I would have never thought about ever, you know, but just getting that mm -hmm. little snippet of that family's um, interaction with that culture, you know, did sit with me and I hadn't thought about it for a while until I was thinking about um, cultures within the community that we work with, um, with individuals who largely have disabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's why we have fields of cultural studies is it's, it's complicated, right? And it, and it evolves and changes. And um, I think people getting, you know, exposure through listening to other stories or getting their own experiences by, you know, cross-cultural travel, um, which is something, unfortunately, the pandemic has put a halt on. But, you know, I highly recommend students study abroad if they can, or people get, you know, experiences outside of their native countries so that they have some exposure to other cultures and, and other languages and other traditions. And I think it makes people just more appreciative of the vastness of the world and culture and, and like I said before, being a better global citizen. So, but that's the first step is learning about it, is asking questions and reading the literature and talking to people and, and learning about it. And, you know, I think, I think nobody expects everyone to be an expert, but <laughs> but knowing that someone cares enough to learn or or is curious to learn the the history, that that's you know appreciated. I think. Well, tell us a little bit about your future focus for your upcoming studies. Obviously, it's in social psychology, um, so it's not exactly in behavioral analysis, but. Um, you know, I, you have a lot of things that you studied um, that are just so. Re um, like pertinent to our field. So tell us, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what, do, what are your future focuses or what are you focusing on now? Well, so I, I'm more into social neuroscience now. Um, I'm looking at brain mechanisms that are involved in many of these experiences. So I've taken what I've done in the work on diversity in STEM and started to look at brain mechanisms. So 
We've done studies on looking at brain activity when women are exposed to sexism and then how they respond to the sexist interaction. Um, I have studies underway looking at um, manipulating the contextual cues in a classroom environment to be threatening or safe, and then looking at how people respond to that environment in terms of their brain activity and then their academic performance. We even have a study using eye tracking that can look at, you know, if a student enters a classroom and sees different um, decor or a different uh, makeup of the student body, where are they looking and how is that affecting them? Does that affect their physiological arousal? Does that affect their cognitive abilities like working memory? Does it impair their performance on an exam? But then also looking at individual differences of resiliency of, you know, when do people overcome these challenges and still perform well in the face of adversity? So things like having um, a strong identity with the community or having a, you know, um, a high sense of perceived control, that these are things that can protect individuals. So looking at some of the similar concepts that we talked about, but now looking at brain mechanisms that are involved. Gotcha. So what, what, um, what kind of behavioral data are you taking um, when you're doing that? You're not using MRIs right now, correct? You're, you know, probably no, using- No, I use, little. yeah, I use EEG. So we have EEG, we look at brain activity. Um, there's different techniques. There's whole brain activity. We can look at um, asymmetries and hemispheres to look at motivation and, and emotion. Um, we use ERPs, event-related potentials, show how the brain, the neurons, fire when someone is responding to a particular stimulus. So a lot of this is from cognitive neuroscience, um, but social neuroscience is a field that really started to come out in like the early 90s. So it's still fairly young, but it takes the methods of cognitive psychology and neuroscience and applies it to study social behaviors. So, um, so most of the work I do, it's still in the lab. We, we either have students come in and interact in group settings, or we have a student interact on the computer in like a computer environment where we can manipulate things about the environment. Um, there's other researchers who do work in virtual reality as well, like they'll wear a VR headset and they'll immerse them in a virtual environment and have them. Um, for example, my colleague, one of my former students is a postdoc in uh, Northern Ireland at, at um, Queen's University in Belfast. And they're doing a study where they're putting, uh, getting male faculty in STEM to wear a VR headset and they transform themselves into a woman faculty. So they're looking at themselves in the mirror and they're, they have a woman's body and they're now a woman professor in STEM. And so they're doing this to try to reduce gender bias in STEM by having people you know, experience what it's like to be a woman in STEM who um, you know, is constantly experiencing prejudice and discrimination. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, all like you said, it sounds like you're a lot of things that um, probably will trickle into our field. Some, um, not maybe um, primarily, but it's interesting to see how other fields are looking at behavioral data. You know, the neural data that is behavior. You know, heart perceived heart rate. You know, um, are you also doing sweat conduction? Are you? Is that something that you're still looking at? Yeah, we do have electrodermal activity, so we're looking at, um, you know, sweat in the, in the hands. Um, we have eye tracking, we have uh, EEG or brain activity. We still look at cardiovascular reactivity, which I think we, we were doing when you were there, looking at heart rate, blood pressure, blood flow, those kinds of things. So we try to get a, a multiple methodologies to better understand what's going on. That's awesome. Well, Megan, do you have anything else that you want to add about, you know, the paper or I, just, um, focus? Yeah, I feel like Dr. Casada, I could ask you questions all day long, but we should be mindful <laughs> of your time. So maybe we can do a follow-up episode at some point and dive into the, um, the neurobiological things. Um, I'd yeah. I'd be interested yeah. to learn more about that too. Uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for spending time with us and sharing your expertise. Hopefully everyone that's listening is making their own connections uh, to behavior analysis as well. And Julie, thank you so much for the insightful questions and conversation. Well, thank you yes. ladies, appreciate your time today. 
Yeah, thank you for the great questions. Your, Julie, your questions really helped guide this discussion. And I think it, uh, personally, I found it very valuable and I hope everyone else does too. And it's, it's great to make these connections across disciplines with research and practice because that's what we need in order to improve what we know about human behavior is to cross, you know, cross talk across disciplines and, and give research away to the public. So I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Well, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. I will talk to you later. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.